Just Made Media presents One on One, a video podcast featuring exclusive interviews and live performances in our multimedia studio located in downtown Chicago. All right, all right. Once again, in the house, another episode of One on One. Uh, big shout out to the studio audience and my man uh, John Temperson on the uh, video decks again. Uh, big shout out to uh, Ray, uh, Chase Kalor, and Gigi will be our third member on the mic over there. Hello, hello, hello. All right, all right. Uh, proud to introduce my man right here to my left. Uh, our guest for this month, we got my man Yasin Llewellyn. What's good, brother? Hey. <laughs> I'm happy to be here. Thanks for having me, man. All right, all right. So, um, yeah, we're going to get into a lot of um, what Yasin's been working on, uh, how he's gotten started in um, music and the arts, you know what I mean? But, um, yeah, this is this man's a talented producer. Uh, pleasure to be introduced to him through uh, my man Chase. And we've just been hitting it off ever since then, going out to some concerts and talking music and just getting into it. And uh, found out a lot of other interesting things about this guy. You know, he does fashion, and we'll get into that. And um, he's from the land of funk, you know, that's a state, great state of Ohio. Word. So uh, maybe we could even start right there, uh, talking about uh, some of your musical influences, how funk played a part, and just coming up in Ohio, what that was like. Yeah, so, yeah, I was born in Cincinnati, Ohio. Um, and, yeah, like, funk was always around. Like, that's that's the type of stuff that, like, my grandparents listened to, like, my mom listened to. Um, and, you know, like the Isley brothers grew up in Cincinnati as well. They came up around the same time, um, and actually from the same neighborhood as my grand grandma, like where she grew up, where my mom grew up, um, in that time, Bootsy Collins is around, like, I got, I have some family that grew up in the same neighborhood as him, um, but Cincinnati is small like that, so like, you would, you know about all those things coming up a little bit. Um, but as far as my musical influences, it all, I feel like it came from definitely my dad. My dad listened to nothing but hip hop. Like that's where my hip hop gene comes from, like from my mm. dad. Um, Word. He, and I, like I always think about this when I think about like the type of music that I love is like the first albums that I remember like as a kid. So those albums being... Most deaf, black on both sides. Wow. Um, common, like water for chocolate. Cause I'm I'm 25, so like growing up, like being a child in the late 90s, in the late in the early 2000s, those albums were coming out. So like that Soul Quarians era. Right. Um, mm-hmm. And then my dad also listened to like like when it comes to like underground hip hop, he also was a huge Nas, huge Jay Z fan. So I'm getting all of the both sides of that hip-hop spectrum and then coming from my my grandma and my mom was like the r&b so Mm -hmm. lauren hill miss education on lauren hill jill scott erica badu like all of those word word yeah Yeah, definitely a lot of the um the soulful influence you know what i'm saying and um i just you know i want to ask hopefully this guy is from cincinnati but um is the producer dj high tech he's from cincinnati yeah yes. high tech's from cincinnati yeah. word word yep. so you you know um i always notice how um people like high tech definitely uh take on that kind of soulful influence as well he definitely kept it you know pretty hip hop with the boom bap sound mm-hmm. as well you know what i'm saying but he's definitely one of the biggest producers i know that's come out of um cincinnati you know what i'm saying so um, I, I don't know. Are you feeling high tech like that as well, or? Yeah. So my dad was a Quali fan too. Like, mm. I mean, those albums that I'm te- that I was saying that I've heard, like the first albums that I heard, like Equality was in there too. So I was getting that as well. Um, but got more knowledge of like high tech and stuff like as I was getting older and like really studying music and like wh- knowing who produces everything and learning that stuff so right but yeah i i definitely take a lot of influence from um those those type of producers for sure no doubt no doubt all right so then let's um i want to also take it back like i know you're talking about the musical side but um how was you feeling like sounds like your father was like a serious hip-hop head you know and um (laughs) so 
how how did you come to understand about hip hop culture at large? You know, even from beyond the music. You know, like like what was the first times in your life where you started realizing like, yo, this is this is bigger than what it looks like. This is a whole culture. You know what I'm saying? Mm. I think. I mean, like, not to give so much credit to my dad, but, like, he embodied all of that, to be honest. Like, the Shout way, out to your like, dad. Like, yeah, shout out to my dad. <laughs> shout out to Khalil. <laughs> um, but, um, so, like, that and my family, too. So, like, getting all the music that my dad listens to, all the hip-hop where it's coming from, like, like Ghostface Killer, Wu-Tang, like, all of that. And then also, like, my uncle who... He's in, he would be into like the more modern eras. So like in the early 2000s, he was listening to like T.I. and Jeezy and like Gucci. And I'm like, OK, I'm understanding the whole spectrum of like what hip hop is. Um, and just watching like videos, movies and different things like that, that show me like, oh, this is a whole culture. This is like it embodies everything. It's fashion. It's it's graffiti it's dancing it's like all of this so i like i got into it and know like started to know about the coach from that um and then um i think as as i'm gaining those the knowledge of those like albums and different things is when i'm starting to get into it myself to where i'm searching for things even as like a young kid to where i'm like seven years old i think the first album i actually purchased myself was the college dropout Okay. In 2004. <laughs> word, word. Wow. Go ahead. And, and G got a uh, question here. Um, so your father, of course, we're talking about your father, right? Because he's the one that introduced you to all this different music. Um, was your father familiar with Scribble Jam? Are you familiar with Scribble Jam? No, what's Scribble Jam? So back in the late, well, I would say maybe 96, 97, Scribble Jam was this big hip hop event that um, hosted graffiti writers. So we segued into that, right? Um, huge rap battles. I mean, you had MCs coming from all over the states. Um, and famously, Eminem battled Juice. Juice was a Chicago hip hop MC. Anyway, um, they also had DJ battles and breakdancing battles. So I just was curious if your father, um, you know, was part of it because I feel like maybe he was still kind of like if he was part of like some sort of like Cincinnati hip hop scene maybe he might have been around that um, and I've been to Cincinnati um, for Scribble Jam several times um, and I actually really love Cincinnati because that's actually where I met Justin. I know right that's so dope. <laughs> um, so I you know when you first told me you were from Cincinnati I was like yay Oh, my heart. I love that place just because I met Justin there. Yeah. I, um, yeah, you were telling me about Scribble Jam, and I don't, I wouldn't think that my dad was a part of that scene. Um, sure. Um, but, yeah, it sounds really dope. Like, it's, Cincinnati has an interesting hip-hop scene um, and just, like, music scene because it's such a small town, um, at least from, like, what I've known and what I've seen while as I've been growing up. So, yeah, that that sounds really dope. Like, I don't think he was a part of that though. He was <laughs> he was still very much a dad. He was just like a teacher and like a Muslim and just like moving around like as a father in different ways. But he was just cool. Like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and what was it like growing up there? Like, did you were you part of any sort of hip hop or even music scene there? I like. So I have I didn't start making music until like a few years ago to be honest. Oh um, wow! And okay. I I've just been like a rap nerd like I think like my whole life. So like knowing like going through like all these albums that I'm telling you about that's like there as I'm a kid. Um, I'm just listening to them going through like all these different. Um, all the credits and like knowing all this stuff, but I wasn't really a part of any scene. I would, I had friends who were rappers and I used to like love to be a part of the different scenes that they were um, a part of going to their like concerts and things, but I wasn't really engaged in like 
what the scene was. I was engaged as far as a listener. So like I've always been a listener, like a very in-depth listener of music and everything that's around. So like I knew about the scene, the scene I was coming up when I was in high school was like, um, like the SoundCloud rappers, honestly. So sure. like, like um, Insomniac Lambs, like that whole collective in Cincinnati. Um, but a lot of the rappers in Cincinnati also the battle scene too like it was a cool battle scene in Cincinnati so like you had rappers like Young Butter and different like coming up in that era which was really cool but I was I was always engaged listening but I wasn't like attending per se yeah right yo you know what that's an interesting era you know like to me like the SoundCloud era I would say is like a, a real demarcation from my era you know like I was like the first era of like MySpace into Facebook, you know, you, early YouTube, it was all really brand new. The idea of thinking that, like, it was just that easy to have all this kind of worldwide web, uh, web access, you know what I mean? And we definitely, like, we kind of, like, were almost like the guinea pigs of it, you know, because we, um, it was so new that no one knew what to think of it. And then after our era, by the time it gets to SoundCloud, I mean, now even the SoundCloud era is going to go down to history because obviously SoundCloud's still rocking there's plenty of people still um, getting busy on SoundCloud and their name gets out, but that era, in a way, is almost coming to a close because of the the new streaming subscriptions, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, um, yeah, I, I like talking to heads like you, you know, who got that vantage point of, like, that there was actually kind of, like, an excitement around SoundCloud. You know, people felt like, yeah. yo, I'm a, I'm a part of this thing. It seems to just all be happening at once. It's happening everywhere. And what was cool, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but... It kind of sounds like the different geographic areas could kind of also make a, a little bit of distinction for themselves. Like, there's Cincinnati scene. Now everybody in Cincinnati can have SoundCloud to get at each other. You know what I'm saying? And, like, mm -hmm. uh, you might be from the South or the East Coast or the West Coast. And, you know what I mean? Everyone's getting busy with their jurisdiction. And, and I don't know. It's cool. It's almost like on-demand radio. You know what I'm saying? Right. Yeah. And, and also the SoundCloud era, like made it easier for people to blend f with different parts of the the country so like those rappers that i named like from cincinnati a lot of them were like working with atlanta atlanta rappers or rappers from like texas like maxo cream like those type of rappers and collaborating um in different ways so it was a a really cool um insurgence that was happening around that time word, word. no doubt no doubt so so it sounds like you were always a little bit of a of a, a music collector. Now, were you ever from the era where you copping mad physicals, I don't know, records or CDs, or was it strictly downloads, MP3s, you know, iTunes kind of thing? Or, you know, how'd you get into collecting music? I, I will give that credit to my brother. My brother, um, I have an older brother. He He had a laptop before I had a laptop, and I would get all my music from him. So right. he was the same as me to where, like... He was going out to search what is this new music like. He put me on to like countless rappers, like all of the like from Wiz Khalifa to like the Mac Millers, like where we're downloading their whole discographies when it's coming out, and it was all MP3s at this time. So we listened to them just like on the speakers in the house or on our iPods, MP3 players, like. Um, but that started really early too. Like I remember my brother put me on a Drake like before everybody knew who Drake was, like around that time. Got so you. I was it was a lot Jimmy of Jimmy from Degrassi. <laughs> exactly, right. <laughs> like he's like, Man, like somebody just told me this dude like about to be one of the best rappers and I'm like, What? We listening to like <laughs> <laughs> like So Far Gone, like little snips like comeback season and stuff. So right, like right. I was always on top of stuff because of my brother, um, and that ended up just going over to me like after, like after I got my own tools to download stuff. So, okay, cool, cool. So um, we're gonna get back into the music, but um, let's take a little segue to the fashion thing real quick. Um, so, you know, like I've always kind of been down with fashion, kind of known people around it, but. I don't think I've known someone directly who really made that attempt to like I'm gonna make my own stuff, you know. So, when did you, when did you first get a sense of like? Not only do I like it, you know, I like the look or whatever, but I'm gonna go try to do this. Like, you know, how did that whole process start? 
Yeah, so for me, it started, I took, you know, like one of those like home ec classes in high school. Yeah. Um, they taught you how to sew in that class. <laughs> And we sold like a pair of boxers, um, and then <laughs> <laughs> like everybody created their own boxers. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> and and from that, like that, I was like, I know how to sew now. Um, and like maybe like a couple years afterwards, I've always like been like super meticulous about the way I dress. Like I was best dressed in middle school and high school. Like just middle school is funny to me because it's like, why is, why are you like 12 caring this much? Um, right, right. But, but I, um, by the time I was in high school, I wanted my pants to fit a certain way. Like I wanted to tailor my clothes. So I started, I like taught myself how to tailor things and like make my jeans, like lay over my shoe the way I wanted to lay. And then like, just putting in hours and hours of that, like, I started to get ideas to how I want to personalize stuff. So, like, I'm always thinking about, or I was always thinking about, like, how I can make something more expressive of, like, who I am. So, like, even, like, the jacket I have on, like, I'm, like, I'm going to put all these pins on it. Like, I'm going to, like, stitch something on this. Like, so I was, I was tailoring clothes a lot, and then I ended up, like, um, kind of using it as like a side hustle too so like right. um tailoring clothes for other people um because they would be like yo those are dope um and doing that all the way throughout by the time I went to college and came to Chicago was when I was like really having ideas for designing clothes so I was I was creating different things and personalizing, making one of one pieces um, nice, nice. and starting to get into fashion shows like once I was in college. So word, word. Yeah. Did you, did you only work on men's fashion? I, so what I try to do, I want all of my clothes to be unisex. Like I hmm. think, I think it's a lot of power in like removing gender from clothing. Okay. Cause I do it myself and I feel like just my, the way that I think about clothing is like women can wear anything like women women's silhouettes and the way that those ideals are it's like they can be more fluid in different ways and i feel like i am empower myself by doing that as well so like i would wear like i'll wear something that's women's and you wouldn't even know it but like and that's what i want to bring to like the clothing that i do so all the pieces that i create i, I will style them on a woman but you wouldn't really think it's a men's piece but like this is also men's as well so that's my like philosophy around it i like the cardigan i would wear that <laughs> yeah this, this is a women's jacket yeah like, there you go <laughs> you wouldn't even know i would wear that <laughs> yeah I, I just i just think it's dope too because um you know i think that as the years went on in like hip-hop culture and, and, and you know i like labels you know rocking brand names like anybody else does but um, we're so used to like big companies kind of providing hip hop fashion, but it, the old days, the early days of hip hop, there was a lot of customization of clothes and a lot of like, yeah. um, little like around the way people, you know, just making gear, customizing it with names and yeah. the haberdasheries, the haberdasheries, you know what I'm saying? And, um, <laughs> you know, but just everyone thinking to themselves, you know, like in hip hop culture, I make an individual name for myself so I can stand out. And it's not about like your ego per se. Even it's more like showing confidence and pride into yourself, you know, and, exactly. and showing that you know that you you have a sense of dignity and self esteem, and that's actually very important to hip hop culture. You know what I mean? So um, that's sort of really where I find hip hop fashion actually plays that positive role. It's not just about like bragging, you know. It's but it's bragging with the intent to like just be, be dignified, you know what I mean? And stand up for you and yours, you know what I mean? So I love that. I yeah, love that. word up. So I could really appreciate you being down with fashion. And like I said, I haven't met someone in a while who's really like has their hands in two pots. Like they do music and fashion, you know what I'm saying? So um, yeah, so maybe you could talk a little bit about um, how you see fashion and music, like, you know, where it intersects, you know what I mean? And especially yeah. for like your music and, and where you plan to go with what you're working on right now. Yeah, that's... Yeah, I I think so I'm a I've realized that I'm a designer like first and foremost like and that doesn't that doesn't like 
pigeonhole me to anything because I think about it in super broad ideals. Like, like I like went to school to be a graphic designer. I design clothes. I feel like I design beats. Like, I feel like I design a sound for artists when I'm creating something. Um, and I really, all, all art forms really coincide. It's just about the way you look at it and the way you use whatever tools you have to be able to like do it to the best level that you can. Um, I always, I also studied architecture and I think architecture from the basis is like one of the like, I feel like one of the first art forms in a way where it's like everybody needs a house, but like after a while building just four walls and a roof is gonna be different. Like it has to be something beautiful about it like it has to be something that you love to be in and I feel like designing anything is the same way where it's like yeah we love music for its use to like make us feel good and make us um make us get through this life but it has to be beautiful sometimes it just has to be beautiful sometimes it doesn't have to like be overthought and I feel like I I approach all of the art forms that I um going to with the same mindset of a designer and using all of the different design elements to create what I want to create. No doubt, no doubt. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yo, that's so funny you said about architecture. That was like my uh, secret dream job um, <laughs> to Mine study too. architecture. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, it is a design. It is a design. And, um, you know, uh, just to blow the spot a little bit because – like I said, I met you through Chase. I was um, in the other room. You guys were working on a song here, and fire. you know, the, the it was fire. Fire. Um, the walls are thin enough that even though you, y'all have privacy in the second room, in the front room, we can kind of hear what you're doing. You know, so we were. It was just cool for me and G to hear in the background you were designing. You guys were actually like there was a lot of improvisation in your session. Um, and I love those kinds of sessions, you know, where it's not so dry. It's more like people are really collaborating. They were like, I want to, like, understand what the artist is doing. Let me design around that. And, uh, yeah, so anyway, it was nice to observe that uh, that work process that y'all was having. Yeah. And, um, yeah, real dope, real dope. Um, words. So why don't we jump into the part now where you're really starting to take uh, music more seriously, you know? And yeah. what kinds of... Um, uh, either beat machines or, you know, what was your approach at first when you first started uh, messing around with making beats? Man, so I think it's really cool the way I got into making music because it was, like, so natural. Um, like, I remember, like, in high school, I was telling y'all, like, my, my brother had a laptop. That ended up getting passed down to me. And I, like, I downloaded Fruity Loops, but his laptops were so, like, old. By that time, I was, like... I was like, man, I, I want to teach myself how to do this, but it's not going, like, I can't do it right now on this laptop. Um, so, like, so I threw that 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 idea away when I was in, like, high school. And then, like, by the time I got to college, um, my roommate, Kellen, who's a musician, um, a jazz musician, so he was studying jazz music at DePaul while we were there. Nice. Um, he He had Ableton on his computer, and he taught, taught me like the small little things about like just how to make music you know like the metronome how to stay like different things like that um so when I was roommates with him I would be in his room for hours just doing that um and then that went away too because like life just goes on and then by the time I was a senior is when I was like really starting to get it because I um I took a study abroad trip to Paris and mm -hmm. My mm. one of my friends who was on the trip gave me logic, like he put logic in my my laptop. So nice, like nice. that's when everything started. That's when um so this was summer of twenty nineteen. Um and I'm just teaching myself because I'm like, I got the basic tools like from what I learned in Ableton from Kellen and then I'm like, All right, I'm just gonna teach myself how to do this and and I was I was taking that time throughout twenty nineteen to do it. And then, like, what happened at the top of 2020? COVID. That's right. So I was in the house, and mm -hmm. <laughs> all I was doing was making beats. Mm -hmm. All I was doing was telling myself, how, teaching myself how to make beats. I started getting good at it, and that's where it all started. Like, 
just those hours and hours of time that I had during COVID. Um, and it just, it just ended up being the creative outlet that I needed because I wasn't designing clothes at the time. Um, and like some tumultuous things happening in my life, but I was mm, like, mm. I was able to use this to like express myself. Like I use all my other art forms to express myself. And it's like, this is my era of music now. And like, it's like fully a part of me now. So. Word, word. Yeah. That's what's up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, I, I talk to G about it all the time. I mean, this um, COVID was like the big remix, you know what I mean? Everybody's got a mm -hmm. COVID story, you know, yeah. and how they had to adjust and how they had to, um, you know, and, and big shout to everybody who was able to find something to kind of hold themselves down mentally, you know. Uh, our prayers go out to everyone who, you know, there's still people affected by what happened in COVID, you know, and it wasn't easy for everyone, you know what I mean? So things like music was, that was holding us down, you know, keeping our frame of mind sharp and healthy, you know, yeah. balanced the best we can. So mm -hmm. word and um did you did you have some say or okay, no doubt. <laughs> so all right, word. So now are is there like a whole cast of characters that you're kinda of working with right now? You have some records that, you know, your solo records, like what what's on the on the deck for you right now? So yeah, so like around that time when I started, like I say in twenty twenty when I was like really putting hours and hours of music like into making music was when I connected with my friend for a long time here in Chicago, Malvo, who is also my barber. So I've known him since like 2016. Um, and then like he was the first person that I was like, I showed some music to. And he's been making music here in Chicago for like, for a long time. Like he's been on the scene for a while. Um, and I showed him some music. He was like, he was like, wait, you made this? Like, he he was like listening to it. He was like, "Yo, like send me that." Like, yeah, yeah. And he he was the first person to um, rap over my stuff, and and now we just been creating since then. Like that's like if I'm making some tracks, like then they're going to Malvo type thing. Like I so all of 2020 was when I was making things and sending it to him, and so we've. I've produced on his last two albums that's come out, um, and you should check those out. The first one was called Homage, um, Art Basel, Chicago, 96, which is a really dope project. Um, nice I, name. I like that name. <laughs> yeah, and what he's doing with that is so cool, and I love that I was able to, like, be a part of that and, like, kind of ignite the process because he um, he really, like, it was a lot of sample-driven, like, chops that I was sending to him. Um, and he was like, yeah, this is like, I'm like paying homage to hip hop with this and like keeping this, this type of sound alive with this. And I also, so after the first homage project, he did homage, um, blue and rose, which was a, like a double disc where I produced the whole first half, mm -hmm. um, the blue side and, uh, Tony Baines produced the whole second half. He's a producer from Chicago as well. Um, mm -hmm. and yeah, so I'm. I'm continuing to work with him because we have we've built this this chemistry um and like it was already the way like the reason it was so like easy because it was already built before I ever sent him music like I've known him for 5 years and like if you think about how often you talk to your barber for like 5 years like before making some music um yeah, yeah, yeah. All, we've already bonded over music for that long right. to where like it was already created once I started like diving in and him being so like talented and knowledgeable from making music for so long. So more things coming on the way from him. Um, and then more things coming on the way with other artists like Chase, hopefully we get some stuff done. Um, I'm starting to branch out to just more people that are friends of mine, um, make more R and B things as well. Um, and also I'm, trying to get this um, instrumental project out this year as well. So Word. those are the different things on the horizon. No doubt, no doubt. And um, yeah, just real quick, uh, lastly, I uh, want to talk about um, any kind of performances you've been up to or um, any performances you're looking to get into this year? Um, not any performances per se, um, but I'm hoping to do more um, different events with my music. So 
like maybe like listening sessions and like blending it with other artwork that I'm doing as well. Um, but I, I'm very much like a a producer producer where like I don't I don't want to be in the forefront. Like I want to be the canvas for someone else to be in the forefront when it comes to the music for sure. Word, word. Nah, I could feel that. But you know what? That's why we do the one-on-one series. This is an opportunity, you know what I mean, for producer-type people that um, might normally play the background. You know, you could be live and direct and, and people can come and get to know what you do, you know what I mean, first and foremost right here on something like this, a one-on-one interview. So, yeah, we was uh, definitely a pleasure to, uh, to get into it with you guys. Seen, um, so maybe we could talk a little bit about the set that you're going to do today, on yeah. the, um, you know, what your setup is and... You know, just what the vibe is going to be like. Yeah, so my setup today, um, I usually do most of my stuff through just my laptop, my MacBook Pro. Um, but I also have a Kai MPK Mini, Mini that I've been working on, um, working with. Um, but yeah, I, I have this sample that I've been like waiting to chop up. So that's what I'll be working on today. That's what's up. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So we about to get into um, Yasin's set. And uh, yo, pleasure uh, talking with you. Looking forward to the music yeah. coming out this year, right, brother? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, thanks. thanks. For me, man. Thank you. Thank right. you.
So what you see me doing here is grabbing a sample that I wanted to chop for a long time by the Chicago Gangsters. And you're just checking out my process here. So in the process of chopping samples the way that I do it, it's a lot of start and stop and clicking exactly where, which part of the sample that I want to take and loop. And in this process, um, you can see me very intently into the Logic Pro where I'm grabbing the checkpoints where I want to take each single part of the song. And I'm replaying it and making sure that I get it right on the bar line so that all of the loops connect seamlessly. And as I'm playing this one, I know that there's two parts of the song that I want to take. A part that's going to be where the verse is going to be, where the intro is going to be, and also taking parts of the song where I want the chorus to be. So. The big horns when it comes in and the breakdown, I know that's going to be the, the hook. And that's where I'm going to change up the drums. And as you see, I took the sample and I sped it up. And now you hear the loop. Now this loop is sounding exactly how I want it. Now we change the pitch to make it something totally different to where it's not the same song and gives it a whole different feel. Like if you change the pitch up, it'll give a more like lively feeling if you change it down, depending on how the sound sound. It'll sound more like grimy hip hop a little bit. Now I'm ready to lay the, lay the drums. So those were the drums that I laid specifically for the verses of the track in the intro. And I'm sequencing those drums to the loop. Now I'm preparing to lay the drums for the chorus. So I just laid a few vocal samples and right now I'm trying to find even more effects to make the beat unique in different ways to where it's like different things you won't expect to arrive in the beat to give it more personality. I was looking for a specific one to make the opening of the loop feel more triumphant that 
that's a beat tag that I use for most of my beat tags that I'm about to lay here. I just laid the, the drums for the breakdown into the chorus and now I'm continuing to sequence it and line it all up in logic. song is essentially done. It's all about the arrangements. So I'm going to add an intro and also an outro to the beat. So I'm just sequencing this track at this moment. So, yeah, this is the part where I'm essentially just sequencing the, the beat. So I'm dragging each of the elements that I laid and arranging them and counting how many bars I want it to be for the breakdown, how many bars I want it to be for the verses, um, adding the intro that I wanted to add so that the sample comes in and then the beat switch comes in um, and I'm also making sure that there's an outro as well so all of the elements that I added at this point is now about designing the beat to take it where I want it to go so here's the finished product about to play the beat
Yeah, yeah. That's what's up. That was very different than what we normally do. He he did like a beat tutorial. You know what I'm saying? Word, word. So, um, and I'll make sure we uh, label it as such. This man just chefed it up right in front of you. He just showed you his whole workflow process. Word. Um, that's going to go down in history. That's mad different. <laughs> word, word, word. So, um, yeah, man. My man gets busy with the Akai uh, Mini and uh, Logic Session. You know what I mean? You've seen, you know, it's aesthetic. He chopped it up right in front of you. Yo, very dope, man. Yo. <laughs> That's the design factor right there, right? You know, I got that mic. Just hold on, hold on. Let me give you a different mic. I was just about to say, it was very architectural. Word up. <laughs> you know, the very des designer-esque. That's what's up. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, man. Any last thoughts before we get out of here? Um, yeah, just thank you for having me. This was fun, man. I appreciate y'all so much. Um, and yeah, I'm about to just keep cooking up. More to come. Perfect. <laughs> thank you so much. That's what's up. Yeah, another episode of One on One. Big shout out to the uh, studio audience again. Uh, Gigi, my man Chase Calor. We got Ray and uh, John Temperson on the boards. As always, if you could bring us out to the outro. Uh, one love and peace. See y'all next time. Peace.